Welcome to this short series on the five devotional writers from the 14th century which together have come to be known as the English mystics. My name is Emma Pennington and I'm a canon here at Canterbury Cathedral. In the following five videos, one devoted to each writer, I invite you to explore with me these remarkable people who they were, what they wrote, and how over six centuries later they still speak to us today. Today we are in Yorkshire with the first and earliest of our five so-called English mystics, Richard Roll. Richard Roll was born around 1290 in Thornton near Pickering in Yorkshire. Son of William Roll, it was through the financial support, though, of Thomas de Neville, the Archdeacon of Durham, that he was sent to study at Oxford. Roll returned home only a few years later without a degree. Apparently dismayed at the aridity of the curriculum at Oxford. It was when he was then back home that he purportedly fashioned a rough and ready hermit's habit from his father's reinhood and his sister's two shifts to run off into the woods and live the life of a hermit. Initially, this life as a wandering religious was located in the estate of John de Dalton, whose son Roll had met at Oxford. But after leaving Dalton's estate, he moved around somewhat until he found a more permanent dwelling near the nunnery at Hampole in Yorkshire. There he acted as a spiritual guide to at least one of the nuns, Margaret Kirkaby, who had chosen the anchoritic life. It was for her that he wrote one of the most well-known of his epistles, the form of living. He wrote it for her as an introduction to her new life of enclosure. Roll was a prolific and very versatile writer. Today he's probably best known for his English contemplative epistles, which along with the form of living include the commandment and ego dormio, all written in the 1340s, and all written, as I say, in English. But other works range between handbooks for priests, commentaries on psalms, and biblical books, books of ascetic guidance, letters, poems, meditations, and his autobiographical work, Incendium Amoris, or the fire of love. Written in Latin, the prologue captures many of the hallmarks of Roll's effusive and sincere writing, which made him so captivating and popular in his day. We hear it now in English, in an English translation by Clifton Walters. I cannot tell you how surprised I was the first time I felt my heart begin to warm. It was real warmth too, not imaginary, and it felt as if it were actually on fire. I was astonished at the way the heat surged up and how this new sensation brought great and unexpected comfort. I had to keep feeling my breast to make sure there was no physical reason for it. But once I realised that it came entirely from within, that this fire of love had no cause, material or sinful, but was the gift of my Maker, I was absolutely delighted and wanted my love to be even greater. And this longing was all the more urgent because of the delightful effect and the interior sweetness which this spiritual fire fed into my soul. Before the infusion of this comfort, I'd never thought that we exiles could possibly have known such warmth. So sweet was the devotion it kindled. It set my soul aglow, as if a real fire was burning there. Yet as some may well remind us, 
there are people on fire with love for Christ, for we can see how utterly they despise the world and how holy they are given over to the service of God. If we put our finger near a fire, we feel the heat. In much the same way, a soul on fire with love feels, I say, a genuine warmth. Sometimes it is more, sometimes less. It depends on our particular capacity. What mortal man could survive that heat at its peak, as we can know it even here, if it persisted? He must inevitably weak be wilt before the vastness and sweetness of love so preferred and heat so indescribable. Yet at the same time he is bound to long eagerly for just this to happen, to breathe his soul out with all its superb endowment of mind in this honeyed flame and quit of this world be held in thrall with those who sing their maker's praise. For some things are opposed to charity, carnal, sordid things which beguile a mind at peace. And sometimes at this bitter exile, physical need and strong human affection obtrude into this warmth to disturb and quench this flame, which metaphorically I call fire because it burns and enlightens. They cannot take away what is irremovable, of course, because this is something which has taken hold of my heart. Yet because of these things, this cheering warmth is for a while absent. It will reappear in time, though until it does, I am going to be spiritually frozen, and because I am missing what I have become accustomed to, will feel myself bereft. It is then that I want to recapture that awareness of inner fire, which my whole being, physical as well as spiritual, so much approves. With it, it knows itself to be secure. Nowadays, I find that even sleep ranges itself against me. The only spare time I have is that which I am obliged to give to slumber. When I am awake, I can try to warm my soul up, though it is numb with cold. For I know how to kindle it when the soul is settled in devotion, and how to raise it above earthly things with overwhelming desire. But this internal and overflowing love does not come when I am relaxing, nor do I feel this spiritual ardour when I am tired out after, say, travelling. Nor is it when I am absorbed with worldly interests, or engrossed in never-ending arguments. At times like these I catch myself growing cold, cold until once again I put away all things external and make a real effort to stand in my Saviour's present presence. Only then do I abide in this inner warmth. I offer therefore this book for the attention, not of the philosophers and sages of this world, not of great theologians bogged down in their interminable questionings, but of the simple and unlearned, who are seeking rather to love God than to amass knowledge. For he is not known by argument, but by what we do and how we love. I think that while the matters contained in such questionings are the most demanding of all intellectually, they are much less important when the love of God is under consideration. Anyhow, they are impossible to understand. So I have not written for the experts, unless they have forgotten and put behind them all those things that belong to the world, unless now they are eager to surrender to a loving, a longing for God. To achieve this, however, they must first fly from every worldly honour, they must hate all vainglory and the parade of knowledge, and then conditioned by great poverty through prayer and meditation, they can devote themselves to the love of God. It will not be surprising if then an inner spark of the uncreated charity should appear to them and prepare their hearts for the fire which consumes everything that is dark and raises them to that pitch of ardour which is so lovely and pleasant. 
Then will they pass beyond the things of time and sit enthroned in infinite peace. The more learned they are, the more ability they naturally have for loving, always provided, of course, that they both despise themselves and rejoice to be despised by others. And so because I would stir up these means every man to love God, and because I'm trying to make plain the ardent nature of love and how it is supernatural, the title selected for this book will be The Fire of Love. Roll as a person was deeply influenced by the powerful preaching of the friars who had flourished in England since the 13th century. As a kind of antidote to the reasoned theology of scholasticism, the friars sought to win men's hearts rather than bore their minds. They were another aspect of the affective stream of piety which had flowed through the medieval period since Anselm and focused on arousing a highly emotional and personal response to Christ through preaching, writing, prayer and art. Roll picks up and continues this tradition. Not only are his contemplative texts and passion meditations largely about moving the reader through to a performative engagement with his text and involvement within it. But also for Roll, contemplative prayer itself is all about what you experience and how you feel. His contemplative texts are instructive, yes, but most of all, he wants to trigger an emotional response in his reader. A response which stirs up a feeling of the fire of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In his own highly emotional contemplative life, he describes this feeling in terms of fervor, dulcor and canor, or heat, sweetness and song. Even in his own time, Roll was highly criticised for his emphasis on the emotional path and we know today how easily that can be induced, abused and manipulated. But he does awaken the adolescent in us all and soften our hearts to weep at the foot of the cross and be taken out of ourselves in awe and wonder at the beauty and glory of God. At the same time, he puts into our hands, even today, texts which have the power to move us and remind us of God's presence. For an age where God could feel very distant, this direct access to an intimately personal relationship with God was seen as a tonic for a troubled age. Then, as it can be for us now. Next time we head to Lincolnshire and the more measured guidance of the Augustinian canon, Walter Hilton. Thank you very much for watching.